I started hypnotizing people as a kid. Um, it was an unusual, let's take the Ericksonian purple one. It was an unusual journey um, insofar as we, we moved to Canada from England when I was a boy. And um, when I was at home with the family, I'd speak to everybody like this. Is, is your mum coming in? No, she'll be around later on. You know, I, was, I was from Manchester. And uh, our house essentially was Coronation Street. In fact, my uncle Bud, who I cre used to model the character, the, the one who was always telling the remarkable stories from the war, that was my uncle Bud. That, that was, he was actually my mum's uncle, so he was my great uncle, and he was on Coronation Street. Oh, by the way, all the metaphors have a purpose. So just so you think, I, you know, when you think I'm rambling or something. But um, Uncle Bud would do that over dinner. He'd just, out of the blue, he'd say, I remember one afternoon sitting in the trenches looking across at the Germans, and we go, oh, here he goes. And he'd get the thousand-yard stare, and he'd be back in the frickin' war. He lost his um, earlobe in World War I. And uh, so he, he became the foundation of so much of the stupidity that's in our podcast. I think he'd be really happy. He was in Coronation Street for years. He always did bit parts. Bud Ralston, you can Google him. And that was his stage name. He'd always be in the pub throwing darts or something or yelling at someone in the background. So I grew up uh, with a family, very, very English. And I was very English at home. And I was Canadian at school. And the problem was, you go to school and you bring your friends home. Who am I supposed to be now? I can't remember which one's me. Am I the English lad or am I the Canadian kid? You know, is it Man United or is it the Toronto Maple Leafs today? So it was very, very trying. And my parents were true English eccentrics. Is there any other kind? My dad thought nothing of, you know, wearing a hanky on his head and it, it, oh. odd. And my mom was uh, traumatized. She had PTSD clearly from the war because, you know, although my mom and dad did not go overseas to fight the Germans, the Germans came to them in Manchester. And with the Manchester Blitz, they lost 3,000 houses in one night. My dad was Royal Engineers and he was stiff upper lip. Nothing, nothing would stress my dad. Nothing. Any, anything could be fixed with a cup of tea. You know, Dad, I've just had my leg blown off at the hip. Yeah, have a cup of tea. It'll be all right. I've had worse than that. <laughs> nothing. It's nothing, lad. My mum was the opposite. Everything scared her to death. Everything. And I think she was traumatized by the war and always waiting for the Germans to arrive. Always waiting for the Gestapo to show up at the door. And being a 12-year-old boy at the time, I used to capitalize on this and just burst in the room suddenly because she'd always jump and start yelling in German, you know, which means, are you a master chimney sweep, which is even funnier when you think. And she'd go, oh, bloody hell, Mike, don't do that. And um, I started seeing you could change people's states really, really quickly. And so I started experimenting with this bizarre thing with my two friends, Brian McDowell and Steve Bowman. We'd be walking home from school and I discovered if I talked to them in a certain way, I could make them angry with each other and they'd wind up having a fight on someone's lawn, punching each other's lights out, which as a pretty weird kid I found to be highly entertaining. And it got to the point, this became context anchored, meaning just walking home with me set the context, the framework, this would start happening again, and they start fighting again. And I'd sort of point them at each other, so they're talking, and I'd step out of the frame, and then they'd wind up fighting, and Brian could see through it at one point. And he said, Steve, it's him. Don't you understand? He's doing this. Can't you see? Can't you see? And Steve said, all I can see is you're really pissing me off again. And wham, I would start again. And I thought this was brilliant. I had no idea I'd discovered some of the Ericksonian patterns. Not a clue. And I was using them intuitively as a kid. Now, at this time, um, my dad thought I was watching way too much television because in North America we had a trillion channels then. When, when we came over from England, there was only BBC and ITV. That was it. And um, so we got all these amazing television channels with lots of commercials, ad, ads and so on. And I was fascinated by it. But my dad said, I want you to read more. I said, get me some books. So he dragged me off to a bookstore in Toronto and said, any book you want you can have. First one I saw, it was Walter B. Gibson, Key to Hypnotism. And it had a line on it, something like, hypnotize anyone instantly, force them to obey your every command. When you're a 12-year-old boy and you read that, you get some pretty interesting ideas. <laughs> and so I got the book, and I went home, and I memorized the contents, and I went looking for someone to hypnotize. And we had a couple of friends next door, Wayne Gibbs, who I ran into a few years ago, and his brother Max. And I managed to hypnotize Wayne. In my, he was my first subject. And I created arm catalepsy, his hand went numb, he had glove anesthesia, and I stuck pins in his fingertips, and they would bleed, and he couldn't feel it. And his mom was furious with me and forced me to stop. But that created my interest in hypnosis um, 52 years ago. And so I started doing it, not realizing that this thing I was doing with my friends, getting them to fight with each other, was hypnosis too. That was just that other weird thing I did. And so it became a major interest. 
And then around 18 years old, I had a breakthrough. I was at a friend's place for a party and he had a bunch of people over and um, one guy was sitting playing his guitar, playing a Stairway to Heaven 50 million times and nobody would stop him because we were scared he'd start on House of the Rising Sun. And he's kept playing and playing and playing. Someone said, shut him up. I said, maybe I should hypnotize him. And they said, oh, can you do that? I said, oh yeah, sure, I've been doing it for years. Well, not very well up to that point, just Wayne with a hand and a few other things. And so he wanted to be hypnotized. We took the guitar off him, thus effectively disarming him. And there were two young girls there too, well, teenage girls. They said they wanted to be hypnotized as well. Three of them on the couch, set them there in a row. And I go into my Walter B. Gibson method. I had a coin originally, I had them stare at a coin, but I didn't have a coin, so we grabbed a candle. And I'm you're getting sleepy, you're getting tired. They're getting burned. I'm dripping wax all over them. I'm way too close. But um, all of a sudden, they <laughs> bang, all three of them go into trance. And John Cole, whose apartment it was, he said, what happens now? I said, I don't know, it's never worked this well before. He said, well, do something weird. So the Rolling Stones had just come through town. Uh, that, that was before you know, Mick Jagger started to look like Don Knotts, but it was way, way back then. And so I said, when you awaken from hypnosis, the next person who walks through the door of the apartment will be Mick Jagger. And I wake them up, snap them out of it, and we're all waiting. And time goes on, 20 minutes, half an hour, nobody showed up because it's late. And I start thinking, oh, it's not gonna work, it's too late. But studies done by Andre Weizenhofer and others have indicated that a properly set hypnotic suggestion, <coughs> there is no time limit on it on the proper resolution of the spike you're creating. So what will happen is you can hypnotize someone and say on July 15th, 2019, you will awaken at 3 a.m. and phone this number. The person will if you set the suggestion properly. So half an hour was nothing waiting for someone to show up. Finally, the door opens and our friend Pat comes in. Now Pat was from Kingston, Jamaica. He had transferred to our school. And by his own admission, he did not closely resemble Mick Jagger. <laughs> So all three of them freak out. This is Mick Jagger. He's like, what? He's wondering what they've been smoking. So they're all over him trying to get his autograph and they're touching him and stuff. And what are you doing here? This is amazing. Snap them out of it. And I said, what did you experience? And the response changed my life. It fascinated me because their response was different in each case. The one girl said, I knew it was Pat, but I found myself saying it was Mick Jagger. I couldn't stop myself. And she said, I could hear that I was doing this. So she was dissociated from it. So classic hypnotic phenomena. The other girl said, no, no, no. Um, he, oh, I can't remember, there's something like, one of them said, it looked like Mick Jagger. It didn't look like him, but I knew it was him. Yeah. But the guy's response was the best. He said, it was Mick Jagger wearing, the girl said, it was Mick Jagger wearing a, a clever disguise to look like this Jamaican guy. That was it. The guy said, no, I don't know what these two are talking about. I saw Mick Jagger. For him, the experience was complete. He saw him come through the door and interacted with him. And that's how he remembered it. And I thought, wow, this is, this is really, really weird stuff. And so began pursuing it with alarming frequency. And so it led to doing hypnosis all over the place and, and teaching it, which leads us to our model. What I was doing back then was this. Classical model, hypnotist, oh, not very thick, does action to subject. Now, do you like the little symbol I just made up for does action? Hypnotist does action to subject equals trance. And this is the, the way that people perceived hypnosis for very many years. The idea then being that the hypnotist has the responsibility of creating the trance in the subject. All the onus is on the hypnotist to do it properly and the subject becomes this passive recipient of hypnotic procedure. Just sits there and waits for something to happen. Now the problem is, if one adopts this model, what typically happens is, you will get 10% of people are great subjects, you know, 40% are moderate, 30% can't be hypnotized, these crazy scales and models they come up with. The kill rate drops very quickly when you adopt this method, because you are now responsible for inducing trance in this person and causing the, whatever the trance happens to be in that situation. But all the onus is here, and the passivity is here. So the Ericksonian model that we're doing today deals with it totally differently. The idea is hypnotist and subject. Subject begins with an S, not a T. The beauty of this is we can start again. <laughs> hypnotist and subject are in a psychodynamic loop with each other, a communication loop, and the result is hypnotic trance. So, the two of them work together to create the trance rather than this being the sole responsibility of this person. 
So when you correctly and clearly instruct your subject that it is their responsibility to go in trance and yours is just around the process, your kill ratio climbs to about 100% very, very quickly because now it becomes impossible to do it wrong. If you educate the subject and utilize whatever behavior they give back to you, you can create a trance state and it becomes phenomenal. Questions at this point? Does that make sense? So can you imagine how, uh, the, how this affects your, any kind of private practice immediately? People would come in and say to me before when I was a therapist, well, I want to be hypnotized for this or that or the other, but I don't think you can hypnotize me. And I'd always say, you're right, I can't. Oh. I said, the only person who can hypnotize you is you. He said, but I will show you how to create a hypnotic trance. And because I do this 100% right every time, because I've done it a billion times, it'll work. I said, your job is just to respond and be a subject. So when you adopt this model, guess what will happen when you leave this room at the end of the day? You'll discover all the bad subjects have disappeared. They're going to all the other people. God in his providence will somehow send only excellent subjects your way. And the bad subjects will be steered away miraculously to people that use the old model. So we're going to be doing this. So this becomes a relationship. Can you see that? It really, notice the trance isn't over the subject. The trance is between the two of you. Stephen Gilligan calls it the cooperation principle in Ericksonian hypnosis. So the two of you cooperate and create this remarkable thing that we call hypnotic trance. Let me show you. Come up here for a sec. <clears throat> oh, it's all right, Chris. Yeah. I, I think I can still manage it, even at this age. There we are. Have a seat. Would you prefer the hypnosis chair or the trance chair? Yeah, the hypnosis chair. Okay, take that one for sure. All right. <clears throat> so here we are in London. And you've, tra you've traveled quite a distance, right? Right. Right. And um, you, you were telling me earlier that you have lived in the Toronto area in the past, which is kind of interesting, and you've since escaped it. Yes. So did you bring any sort of vestiges of the hypnotic city with you when you left? A bit. A bit. And sometimes a bit can be the right amount. See, a bit, I've found, can lead to a lot. That's right. Can I borrow that hand? Eyes closed now. And as you drift deeper, second by second, and begin to enjoy, I mean really enjoy that changing sensation. That's right. You can notice your breathing has shifted. And as you wonder, I mean really wonder, exactly how that hand is responding, it can be a very simple thing to allow it to sink only as quickly as you go into a deep and profound trance. That's right. And as your hand sinks, as the trance deepens, as your breathing continues to deepen and slow, when your hand touches down on your leg, you can be in a wonderful state to learn. I mean, really learn. And your own skills are going to become amazing today. That's right. And you're unconscious. Mind is listening to me. So why not go even deeper? A person may not know that you're falling into a deeper trance than ever. And when you and all the parts of you recognize that you are here and also drifting there, the muscle itself causes your relaxation as your head continues to get heavy and you can attend, Sam, to your own ecology perfectly and easily. And when that hand, that's right, that one touches down, you can be so deep that nothing will disturb you. Because that psychodynamic loop is increasing. And the intersection of here and now lets your arm grow so heavy so effortless. That's right, all the way into trance. That's right. 
And when your hand touches down, make yourself comfortable and drift even deeper. Now. That's right. Now, if I shift the timbre of my voice and talk to you like this, you'll pay no attention whatsoever because I've switched to the waking world voice and you'll only pay attention when I switch back to go even deeper now, this voice. And so nothing's really happened other than creating this loop, which in and of itself is enough to get a great trance. Sam, when I lift your right hand and let it drop, let me do all the lifting. Just be even more deeply relaxed. I'll lift it by your thumb now. There we are. And so we have the classical hand falls like a, a wet dishcloth. And that's how we have a good trance indicator. Now I'm going to test it a little further here. I'm just going to touch the back of your neck, Sam. It won't bother you in the slightest. There we are. We're, he's almost at somnambulism. And that's just from some really quick, simple intersection here. You can check because when you move the, the back of the head here at the occipital, sort of crevice, roll it with your fingertips. When the person's in a deep trance, their head will feel like it's on ball bearings. It'll just roll around easily. You can't do it in a conscious state. And in a moment, Sam, I'm going to ask you to open your eyes and look at the entire group and then close your eyes and go deeper. You can do that right now, as though you were awake. That's right, all the way back. It's easy to do a false awakening. All you do is say, you can open your eyes as though you were wide awake. And the unconscious gets the, the message right away. It's a great way to interview people because you can put them in a trance, have them open their eyes as though they were wide awake and talk to you as though they're wide awake, but they're still hypnotized. It's a useful thing. So let's give him some nice programs for volunteering, although I did technically volunteer him. Your unconscious mind can write something entirely new. Your unconscious mind can create something you've never done before and work beneath the surface so that today you're going to learn so fast and so thoroughly and you'll be able to apply that new learning process automatically and easily for the rest of your life to whatever you choose to do. And if that's cool with your unconscious mind and you're happy about that, you can nod your head now. That's right. So you see we get psychomotor retardations, a bit of a delay behind it. All concomitant with a nice trans state, all consistent stuff. So let your unconscious write a new learning program. Now I want to be able to track this. So I'm just going to lift your hand again. And you can let it float. And it will only sink down as the program is written and installs completely. When your hand touches down, the program for new learning at heightened speed and depth will be installed and running and you will awaken and notice how good you feel. So we let him write the brain software. And take all the time you need. Hi. Hey. <laughs> Wide awake now, all the way back. Excellent. Give this man a hand. <laughs> Have a seat. <laughs> so, see how easy hypnosis can be? Um, it really, really is an effortless thing, provided you just stick by a few simple principles. First of all, <coughs> we create a psychodynamic loop. I'm entering a loop with him, and I'm calibrating him all the time. Yep. You have to calibrate. You've got to take a snapshot of them the moment they sit down in front of you. And let your brain notice difference. That's it, all the way back. All the way back. <laughs> you can freak people out when they come out of trance. I don't recommend you do this, but you can say things like, are you still going into trance, or are you right out of it? <laughs> ah, ambiguity, help. So um, if you calibrate the person, notice what they look like, notice how they're breathing, the depth of their breathing, their eye movement, everything. Just take a quick picture of that in your mind, because you have to be able to detect difference. If you can't detect difference, you won't know when you've gotten them into trance and you are a superb calibration machine. We, we calibrate constantly. We make complex decisions on highways based on 
you know, intention of other drivers just on their driving patterns that we know someone's going to suddenly pull in front of us. We're doing it all the time. So choose to do it with the person sitting there with you because then you'll be able to see something's happened, the person's gone into hypnosis, which you can then deepen through whatever means you choose. But Derek Bomber, who um, Michael and I both studied with, uh, my mentor in Toronto, uh, amazing hypnosis trainer, and he said, he said, you can't see what you can't see, which of course is a tautology. It's like saying all lawyers are lawyers. It gives you no information. But what he meant was, you can't see what you're not looking for. So you have to be looking. It's far too many hypnotists sit beside the person. They're not even able to get any visual information. So you want to sit where you can see the person easily to be able to get information from them. And um, I saw one trainer in North America from a different school put the person in and out of trance about five times and she was still doing her induction. Hadn't noticed it had already worked a long time ago. He could have stopped and saved a lot of time. So start calibrating from now on. Whatever you're doing, you're going to work with the person and calibrate. So by the end of the day, you'll be talking people in and out of trances very, very easily and effortlessly. But we got to get you there. So you got to walk before you can run.